Repeated sprint training involves maximal effort, short duration sprints, 10 seconds or less, interspersed with brief recovery periods, 60 seconds or less. It can enhance a range of physical qualities and can help prepare intermittent sport athletes for the high intensity demands of competition. In the article, published in the Strength and Conditioning Journal, titled The Application of Repeated Sprint Training, Fraser Furlow and colleagues break down the key programming variables that can be manipulated in repeated sprint training to optimise both acute responses and long-term adaptations. This is Talking Sports Science with a summary of their recommendations. First of all, regarding programme duration, two to six weeks is an efficient time frame for implementing repeated sprint training in order to achieve meaningful improvements. With typical volumes ranging from 200 to 800 metres per session and 400 to 2,000 metres per week. Here's an approximate relationship between session volume and ratings of perceived exertion during repeated sprint training. Specifically, when it comes to low weekly volumes, i.e. 400 to 1,000 metres, they can improve performance with minimal neuromuscular fatigue and are appropriate for in-season training to achieve small improvements in physical performance while avoiding excessive fatigue. In addition, low volumes are recommended at the beginning of a training programme to gradually expose athletes to the intensity of repeated sprint training. Whereas higher volumes, i.e. 1,000 metres per week or more, increase physiological, neuromuscular and perceptual demands and are more suited for pre-season when higher training loads are needed. Furthermore, weekly volumes of between 1,200 to 1,400 metres appears to maximise physical adaptation. However, this depends on factors such as frequency, sets, repetitions and sprint distances in the programme. Moving on to training frequency, one session of repeated sprint training per week can enhance physical performance and physiological adaptations, or at the least, maintain fitness attributes. However, two sessions per week are more effective, particularly in pre-season, when higher sprint volumes are accumulated. And three sessions per week can be beneficial during short mesocycles. For example, six sessions over two weeks improve speed and high-intensity running in soccer players. However, three sessions per week are generally not recommended long-term and have been shown to cause a small impairment in the development of change of direction ability. And regarding the number of reps, provided that repeated sprint training volume is maintained through an increased number of sets or sprint distance, low rep sets, for example between four to six reps, are generally recommended for most, as they help maintain maximal sprint velocity while still providing this substantial metabolic and cardiorespiratory response. Whereas, high rep sets, for example 8 reps or more, may actually limit speed and endurance improvements due to pacing strategies and excessive sprint decrement. However, for endurance athletes, higher rep sets, between 8 to 12 reps, may be beneficial as they can often sustain sprint performance for longer. Moving on to the number of sets. More sets equals greater physiological demand, especially time spent above 90% of maximum heart rate. One set per session is generally insufficient for meaningful improvements, while two to three sets per session are recommended to maximise acute physiological responses and long-term adaptations. And four sets can be beneficial when using low rep sets, i.e. between four to six reps, or during pre-season, to increase training volume. Either higher number of sets are prescribed, to maintain the time-efficient nature of repeated sprint training, shorter inter-set rest times, for example two minutes, can be used, without compromising cardiovascular recovery. Moving on to sprint distance, which can range anywhere from 10 to 40 metres. Short sprints emphasise acceleration loads, help maintain consistent sprint times across sets and are more suitable for in-season training and court-based sports where quick movements in confined spaces are required, whereas longer sprints increase exposure to near-maximal sprint velocities, elicit a higher physiological stress, 
leading to increased perceived exertion, sprint decrement and neuromuscular fatigue and are more appropriate for pre-season or off-season training and team sport athletes requiring exposure to faster absolute speeds. While sprint distance substantially impacts acute demands, it has a minor influence on physical adaptations. Moving on to rest time, both short and long rest times are effective but influence different responses and adaptations. Short rest times, for example 20 seconds or less, lead to higher blood lactate and a greater sprint decrement. Sprint decrement is calculated using this formula, where total sprint time is the combined time of all sprints performed in a session, and the ideal sprint time is the fastest possible time if the athlete maintain their best sprint speed for every repetition. And when implemented over a training program, short rest times can lead to greater improvements in intermittent running performance and 200 meter sprint time compared with longer rest times. While longer rest times, 30 seconds or more, enhance the clearance of metabolic byproducts and allow for increased phosphocreatine resynthesis, resulting in faster and more consistent within session sprint times, while mitigating neuromuscular fatigue. 30 seconds rest between repetitions would appear to be the best option to maintain the physiological demands of repeated sprint training while enabling faster acute sprint performance. Moving on to rest modality, passive rest reduces perceived exertion, enhances phosphocreatine resynthesis, leading to faster sprint times across a set, whereas the acute demands of repeated sprint training with active recovery vary based on the intensity of the activity. However, in general, active recovery can be used to amplify physiological and muscular demands without increasing sprint volume, although this leads to higher perceived exertion and greater sprint decrement compared to passive rest. However, it should be highlighted that the chronic effects of passive versus active rest on physical adaptation have not yet been directly compared. And last but not least, regarding sprint modality, all three sprint modalities, straight line, shuttle and multidirectional, can improve physical performance with similar overall adaptations, but minor differences may be observed. For example, shuttle sprints may elicit a slightly higher physiological, metabolic and neuromuscular load, and so could be more effective for enhancing aerobic capacity. However, this is dependent on the number and angle of direction changes, distance between changes, and the duration of each sprint repetition, which affects the absolute speeds and the work performed during acceleration and deceleration. And that concludes this summary of the effects of programming variables on the acute and chronic responses to repeated sprint training. As always, I recommend you go and check out the full article for lots more nuggets of information surrounding the application of repeated sprint training. Thanks for watching folks, see you next time.